this is too raw for TV. So, um, I've started doing my top 10 center uh, listing today. I'll just do a brief recap at number 10, of course. I had Patrick Ewan. Um, this guy right here is a new entry. Um, just to reference my old top 10, I had Nate Thurman at number 10 and Patrick Ewan at number 9. But what I've uh, changed in my opinion about, I still think Nate's arguably a top 10 center. I have him sort of like number 11, number 12, somewhere in that range now. Uh, but what I've come to realize is that I, a guy that always talks about the ABA, I wasn't giving Artis Gilmore his due as far as how dominant he was in the American Basketball Association. Now, if you're just talking about the NBA, then I don't think Gilmore qualifies as a top 10 all-time center. But when you combine the two, when you combine that he was one of the upper echelon centers in the NBA for many years in, in that league, but he is the GOAT center and the most dominant player in the history of the ABA in many ways. Some people say Julius Irvin. Uh, I can understand that, but from just a dominance as far as scoring, rebounding, block shots, field goal percentage strength, uh, domination, it's Gilmore. When you combine that, in my opinion, with what he did in the NBA, uh, especially winning the championship, of course, in 1975 with the Kentucky Colonels, uh, that, to me, leads him to be a top 10 all-time center. Now, Gilmore, when he played, was rather reserved in nature. Um, oftentimes, from what I remember reading about him, during the playoffs, he had a tendency to fade at times. Also, with the physical gifts that he had, he was seven two foot two. Now, I know he's usually listed at 240. That's a college weight. By the time he was, you know, an NBA veteran many years later, he was probably more around 265, 270 at that time. All right. Um, but the thing about Gilmore is he was dominant, but maybe he could have been more dominant. There were always the inevitable comparisons to Will Chamberlain. He was actually slightly taller than Will. They are considered the two strongest players in the history of the NBA, usually Wilt's number one. There have been so many tales about how strong he was. Even Gilmore will concede that Wilt was stronger than him. But Gilmore, after Wilt retired, was considered the strongest player in the NBA. There were so many different um, stories about his strength, uh, Gilmore, how he's able to just pick certain people up by their shirts, you know what I'm saying, off the ground. Uh, one thing I, I remember about him is he gave Kareem Abdul-Jabbar fits. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar did not, he was a finesse guy. When Kareem first came into the NBA, he was about 225 pounds. Now, due to the fact that to play in the NBA, you're going to have to build some muscle, build some strength to be able to deal with the incessant pounding down low. <coughs> he did put on muscle, Kareem. Uh, ultimately, I think he got as heavy as 265 by the end of his career. But still, um, he did not like to bang. And that was Gilmore's game, to bang. You know, Kareem was more of a finesse guy. And he hated playing against Artis Gilmore. He hated it. You know, uh, Wilt wasn't a primary scorer by the time Kareem was doing his thing. So he didn't have to deal with the constant punishment dealing with Wilt from a defender offensive standpoint. But he didn't like banging with Wilt either. He, he, he just didn't like it. Um, Gilmore, to me, also suffered from the fact that, you look at the fact that he last played the NBA, I think it was 1988, with a short stint with the Chicago Bulls. And you look at that, and you wonder how in the hell did he not get into the to the uh, the Naismith Memorial 
excuse me, the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame for another 23 years, I believe. He didn't get inducted until 2011. And I think part of that is Gilmore's personality, uh, the fact he never won a championship in the NBA, and the fact that, you know, the NBA has always had a historical uh, lack of proper respect, in my opinion, for the ABA. It's only coming to light recently, I think, in my opinion, that they're starting to respect what these players accomplish in the ABA more. That's why you're starting to see guys like Charlie Scott now be inducted to the Hall uh, of Fame, Basketball Hall of Fame. Now you're starting to see more ABA guys. And I, I look, I don't, I'm the type of person, I don't like to talk about myself too much, but goddamn it, I'm going to pat myself on the back of this one. I'm one of the main motherfuckers on here. I'm probably the main motherfucker one who's been campaigning for more ABA players to get their due. And if it has anything to fucking do with me, I'm, I'm damn proud of that, okay? So let me talk about Artis Gilmore. Now, Artis Gilmore was born in Florida. I believe he was born in 1949, I believe it was, in Florida. Let me check that out right quick. Let me make sure I'm correct. Uh, yeah, he was born in 1949 in Chipley, Florida, and, um, by the time he was 15 years old, he was already six foot five, and when public schools were finally integrated, he attended Chipley High School for one week before leaving home to attend Carver High School in Dothan, Alabama, a larger community 35 miles to the south, to the north. He graduated from Dothan's Carver High School in 1967 when he was six foot ten as a third team All American. Now Gilmore played college basketball starting at Gardner Webb Junior College in Bowling Springs, North Carolina from sixty seven to sixty nine. Gilmore led Gardner Webb to the NJCAA tournament in 1968 and 1969. Gilmore averaged 22.5 points and 16 rebounds in his first two seasons. In 1969-1970, Gilmore transferred to Jacksonville University. He led the Jacksonville Dolphins team to a 27-2 record under coach Joe Williams. In the 1970 NBA tournament, Gilmore led the team to the NCAA championship game, where they lost 80-69 to coach John Wooden and UCLA Bruins, as Gilmore scored 19 points and pulled down 16 rebounds. For the season, Gilmore averaged 26.5 points and 22.2 rebounds per game. At Jacksonville, Gilmore became one of five college basketball players Able to average at least 20 points and 20 rebounds over his career at 24.3 points and a staggering 22.7 rebounds per game. Jacksonville led the, excuse me, Gilmore led the NCAA in rebounding both years at Jacksonville, and his career average of 22.7 rebounds per game is still the highest in NCAA Division I history. Now, when he decided to go pro, at this time, we're talking about the early 1970s, players had two choices. They could either go with the more prestigious and more established NBA, or at the time, go for the money, because usually the top players made more money going to the ABA at that time, when it was still rather flourishing, um, which ultimately I think would, would help, would, would play a factor in their demise, that and the fact that they sometimes chose locations that were not really basketball uh, bastion, I guess. So in 1971, Gilmore was drafted by the Kentucky Colonels in the 1971 ABA draft and by the Chicago Bulls in the 1971 NBA draft. The Bulls realized that they didn't really have a chance at signing Gilmore, so therefore... The Bulls used a seventh-round pick to secure 
future rights on Gilmore in the event that he became available. Gilmore signed a two a ten year, two point five million dollar contract with the Kentucky Colonel. Gilmore was so dominant in his rookie year that he earned the rare distinction of being selected for both the ABA Rookie of the Year and the ABA MVP in 1971-72. The Kentucky Colonels finished 68 and 16 after being 44 and 40 the year before. In the NBA, they had 84 game schedules as opposed to the normal NBA schedule of 82 games. Over his five-year ABA career, Gilmore led the ABA four times in rebounding average, twice in both field goal percentage and blocks per game, and once in personal fouls. He was named to the All-ABA first team five straight seasons and the All-Defensive team four times. He played in the ABA All-Star game in all five years and he was in the league and earned a 1974 All-Star game MVP. In 1974-75, Gilmore, alongside teammate Dan Essel, led the 1975 Kentucky Colonels to the ABA Championship, as Gilmore won the ABA Playoffs Most Valuable Player. In the final game of the series against the Indiana Pacers, led by the Raja, Roger Brown, Gilmore scored 28 points and grabbed an unfathomable 31 rebounds in front of 16,000 fans at Freedom Hall. During his days as an ABA dominator, Gilmore established league records for career block shots, 1,431 block shots in a season, 422 in the 71-72 campaign, and rebounds in a game, 40. He averaged 22.3 points and 17.7 rebounds. He shot 58.5% from the floor averaged 3.4 blocks and 3 assists per game in his five seasons there. After the 1975-76 season, the ABA disbanded. Four of his teams, the Nuggets, the Pacers, the Nets, and the Spurs were absorbed in the NBA and the ABA-NBA merger. And the remainder folded, which included the Kentucky Colonels. As a result, Gilmore went to the special 1976 ABA dispersal draft and was chosen first overall by the Chicago Bulls. He signed with them for $1.1 million over three years. <coughs> After four stellar seasons with the Chicago Bulls, where he averaged over 19 points and 11 rebounds. Gilmore was traded to the San Antonio Spurs in 1982. There he teamed with George the Iceman Gervin and formed an exciting tandem. But they were not able to get past the powerhouse Lakers, you know, um, and advance to the NBA Finals. He played with that team all the way through the 86-87 season. And he was twice an all-star with San Antonio. Gilmore rejoined the Bulls for part of the 87-88 season, playing 23 games. And I was incorrect with one thing. I said he ended his career with the Chicago Bulls. He actually ended his career with the Boston Celtics. During the same season, the 87-88 season, uh, he played with the Boston Celtics. And then, during the 88-89 season, he went overseas and played in the Italian League. And uh, he played with Arimo Bologna of the Italian League, where he averaged over 12 points, 11 rebounds, and made the European All-Star team. So we look at his NBA accomplishments. Gilmore played a total of six All-Star games and led the NBA in field goal percentage in four consecutive seasons, including an NBA best 67% during the 80-81 season, at the time the third highest percentage in NBA history. At the time, at the time that he retired after the 88 season, Gilmore held the record for highest career field goal percentage at just a hair under 60%, 59.9%. Now, of course, um, 
that's no longer the case. I think DeAndre Jordan has the record for highest career field percentage. But I just want to say this. It's misleading because a lot of DeAndre Jordan's buckets are alley-oop dunks, um, putbacks. It's not the same, you know what I'm saying? It's not, first of all, he doesn't have the same defensive resistance. Um, he doesn't shoot a lot of shots um, because of the fact that Gilmore and other centers at that time took a lot more shots and much more defensive resistance. They weren't camped right under the fucking basket like that. So in today's NBA, that's why you have a lot of guys who shoot such a high percentage overall. Those who are still post centers, um, not guys that shoot from outside. That's why you have a lot of guys that shoot over 6%, but it's not quite the same to me as, you know, that's why in the 90s and before, you know, shooting 57, 58%, was extremely high. Um, so anyway, Gilmore was inducted to the Nathan Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame during 2011. And when you look at Artist Gilmore's accomplishments, you can see why he warrants a top 10 all-time selection. He was, of course, the ABA, uh, ABA champion in 1974 with the Kentucky Colonels. He was the ABA Playoffs Most Valuable Player in 1975. He was the ABA MVP as a rookie in 1972. Six times he was an NBA All-Star. Five times he was an ABA All-Star, so altogether it's 11 All-Star selections. He was the ABA All-Star Game MVP in 1974. Five-time All-ABA First Team. Four-time ABA All-Defensive First Team. NBA All-Defensive Second Team in 1978. ABA Rookie of the Year in 1971-72. He was on the ABA All-Rookie First Team, of course, in 1972. Four times he led the ABA in rebounding. He was on the ABA All-Time Team. Consensus First Team All-American in 1971. Second Team All-American, AP, NABC, UPI in 1970. Twice he led the NCAA in rebounding. Third Team Parade All-American in 1967. As I said earlier, <coughs> he's the career leader an NCAA uh, rebounding per game average at 22.7, I believe it is. For his career, he scored 24,941 points. He grabbed an astonishing 16,330 rebounds and blocked 3,178 shots. For career averages of 18.8 points, 12.3 rebounds, 2.4 blocks per game, and I believe for his career he shot something around, let me see what he shot for his career combined, uh, uh, NBA and ABA. his career in both the ABA and NBA he shot 58.2% from the floor in the ABA he shot 55.7% from the floor and in the NBA just a hair under 60% so this is a guy whose career spanned from playing in a league with young Julius Irvin at the beginning and ended his career playing with guys like Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, and, you know, Larry Bird, and Kevin McHale, and, you know, he played alongside a lot of great players. He wasn't fortunate enough to win an NBA championship, but he did win the championship with the Kentucky Colonels and the ABA. In my opinion, the ninth greatest center, combined both leagues now, the ninth greatest center in the history of the NBA, or the history of professional basketball, to be more precise. The A-Train, Artis Gilmore. 